Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Blue Maxima, and honestly I've got nothing to put out for you right now. Pato Box Code still hasn't come in, Fist of the North Star hasn't unlocked, and I don't really feel like doing any more Better Late Than Ever videos. I want to try and get the backlog propped up a little bit again before I start relying on those. So, I wanted to actually talk about something. I wanted to talk about the PlayStation Classic, and I know I'm late on this one, but at least people can, can't accuse me of you know, following the trend when it comes to talking about the PlayStation Classic because, well, I grew up on the PlayStation and when I saw this, I was actually rather excited. It looks like a really neat piece of hardware, although there are definitely some things wrong with it. They are promising to include 20 games with it, along with it being basically small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, like the SNES Classic, which I actually own but I haven't actually done anything with because I moved and I really don't have any room for it anymore. But yeah, you get the general idea. So we might as well take a look at the thing. I'm not going to do too much video editing on this one. So you're probably just going to see something like the trailer playing over and over again in a small window while I have a quick look at everything. And more or less, the thing actually looks really cute. I'll give them a lot of credit. They've done a really nice job with it. And the buttons actually work, which I can appreciate. I never actually owned the big grey PlayStation with the reset button on the front. I owned the PS1, which was basically like a halfway between the original model and the classics. So I owned the really small one that had the absolutely tiny buttons on it. And I actually loved that thing. I got a lot more use out of that than you might think. But it's still neat that all the buttons actually work, that you can actually press them in order to do things like swap the disc and save your position instead of them just being like hard plastic buttons on the front. That's actually a really nice little touch. And there are some other things I like about it as well. Like, I can appreciate the plastic controllers. I did end up using them for a bit before I got my hands on a DualShock. But at the same time, I still have a little bit of nostalgia for the little things. And the fact that you can still play the absolute majority of the games on the PlayStation on one of these, although in some cases it would be rather uncomfortable, I completely agree. But being able to use them just as, as they were back when the PlayStation came out is actually kind of neat. And I do kind of approve of their inclusion, although at the same time it would have been nice if they were DualShocks just so we could have Ape Escape in the collection, but I guess that really isn't going to happen, is it? So, they say they're going to be including 20 games, and I'm just going to say it right now, 20 games isn't enough. Especially since you're not going to be able to expand the amount of games you actually have for it. And it seems like that would actually be rather easy to do, especially in this case, because the two ports on the front are USB ports. So all you'd need to do is release like a dongle that plugs into the uh, controller ports. And you just plug it in and then you have a USB port on the front to plug your controllers into like that. And then you can just add, have games on some extra storage that the PlayStation can detect when it boots up. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be a thing and that's actually kind of disappointing because... Well, now that we know that there's not going to be any extra games on this thing, the hackers are basically salivating to add their own games to it. Which I absolutely like the look of because, you know, having this kind of little, neat little box with proper controllers that you can use to play old PlayStation games, it would be nice. It doesn't compare to being able to stick like a 500GB hard drive into your computer and have literally every PlayStation game ever made on it. But at the same time, it would be a nice little nostalgic throwback more than anything else. Although I have to admit, I don't approve of the Australian price. $150 is a really hard ask in Australia. Because, I mean, damn, you could buy like two PlayStation 4 games for that sort of price. Whatever. So, let's get on to talking about the game's library. Now, we don't actually have the entire library yet, and I can kind of understand why. Because when you had like the SNES Classic, it didn't take long from them being announced to actually coming out. And in this case, they had to do it for a whole, like, three months. Actually, you know what? I'm going to pause real quick and just go and check just how long it took for them to come out after their announcement. Okay, so apparently it took something along the lines of three months for the Super NES to come out after it had been announced. So it's around the same amount of time. I guess Nintendo has enough of a hype machine to keep that sort of thing going. Sony, not so much. I mean, they might, they still would have a fair bit of hype going on, but at the same time, they, uh, you know, they, they definitely don't have the sort of pull that Nintendo does, so 
there is a relatively reasonable strategy to them. Like, they've announced five games right now. And I imagine that they could keep announcing, like, packs of five games all the way up to the release on December 8th, I believe? 3rd. December 3rd. So, I imagine that about halfway through this month, and then at the end of the month, then about halfway through November, they could just pace it out every couple of weeks in order to keep people remembering that the PlayStation Classic is going to be a thing. But... I will say that the five they've picked so far are all very solid choices. Final Fantasy VII is, like, obvious. I can't believe they would release a PlayStation Classic without Final Fantasy VII. Then you've got Tekken 3, which, like, the best fighting game on PlayStation? Like, seriously? Just, just in general? Like, you could make an argument that Bushido Blade is better in some ways, and you could make an argument that a game like Bloody Roar is better, than, better in some ways. Tobal or Battle Arena Toshinden or whatever, but Tekken 3 is probably the one choice you want for, you know, having as much impact as humanly possible. You've also got Ridge Racer Type 4, which personally I'm not a big fan of, but whatever. You can have whatever games you damn well like on this thing, and well, to be fair, Ridge Racer Type 4 is a pretty big hitter in the way of PlayStation games, so I can approve of its inclusion, although I wonder if they're going to be releasing a new Ridge Racer on them. PS4 or Xbox One soon, nevertheless. There's Wild Arms, which personally I haven't played, but to be fair, when you hear about PlayStation 1 RPGs, Wild Arms is usually at the top of the list, so I'll give them all the credit in the world for that one, for including something that people would probably remember as being a PlayStation game, and one of the big ones too. And there's also Jumping Flash, which admittedly I didn't have much experience with until I... Um, <laughs> I'm just typing something real quick. I didn't have much experience with until very, very recently, as in a couple of days ago. I picked up the, I picked up a copy of it and played it on an emulator, and it's actually surprisingly good. So I'm not going to argue with its inclusion either. It's a very unique game. It's not like anything I've ever actually played. So its inclusion on here should hopefully give it a few extra eyes. I'll give it a fair amount of stuff for that. So. I actually wanted to talk about some of the games that I wanted to include with the uh, PlayStation Classic, but the thing is, a lot of the games I would usually say are games that will either A, be included, or B, not be included for very, very specific reasons like licensing. So obviously I can't say games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, or Gran Turismo 2, or games like that, right? Games that are just branded, or, you know, Pepsi Man. <laughs> Imagine if they included Pepsi Man on this thing as one of the 20 games. People would freaking riot in both sides of the aisle. There would be people who do not want this shit anywhere near the PlayStation Classic, and there would be people who would be literally praising Sony on their hands and knees for that one. But I don't think that's going to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk about some of the games that I think I would like to be included, but at the same time are probably not going to be included for one reason or another. Except for the first one I want to talk about, because I think it would be an absolute travesty if this one wasn't included. So, I'm just going to say the words Siphon Filter, and then play a clip of one of my favourite Let's Plays of the game, just to give you an idea of how fun these sorts of games are. You know, when I throw between his fucking legs. Wow. Oh. <laughs> well, okay, you got one of them at least. There we go. <laughs> oh, yes! Well, oh, my gentle God, that was incredible. When the charges are set, I'm going to call for an evac of the bridge and then we blow it. Until then, everyone keep watch for load. <laughs> And Torg is like, big deal. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I shut up for Mr. Torg because are you shooting through the engine block? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hey, the, you know what? One guy left. He, they all got sniper rifles and they rapid fire. Well, he's not rapid firing anything anymore. Wait, here we go, here we go. Watch what happens. <laughs> oh, just, they all fall down. Damn. Good, you've seen that? Alright, and also I apologize for the fact that there's going to be some sort of background noise going on. I'll try and mask it with the usual set of music, but there's not really that much I can do about it. Because for some reason, they seem to pick the absolute worst times to do lawn work outside around my place. So there you go. 
So we'll start with one that's a fairly popular one and, you know, one that I wouldn't be surprised if it got included somehow on here. The thing about the 20 games is that you don't really get that much room for the really obscure stuff that deserves an extra pair of eyes. And I'm not entirely sure why, because, I mean, they could do, like, 50 games on this thing. It would probably cause a, a cost a fair amount of money, but with the amount of money they're making on the PlayStation 4, it would be a nice goodwill exercise, but whatever. Especially since you're not including, like, Final Fantasy VIII or Final Fantasy IX along with Final Fantasy VII. It would be nice. Like, imagine if you play Tekken 3 and you finish a game in arcade mode and you unlock Tekken 1 and 2, for example. That would be a really nice thing. You play Final Fantasy VII, you escape Midgard, and then you get to play Final Fantasy VIII and IX. Finish Jumping Flash 1 to get Jumping Flash 2. You get the general idea, but nevertheless, we will talk about bloody siphon filter for a little bit because I absolutely love the weird little third person shooter that it turns out to be. It has some unique concepts that you absolutely could not do today because you would get absolutely lambasted in the games press for doing so which I'm actually kind of disappointed by because its targeting system remains one of the more unique third person shooter ideas. There were a couple of games afterwards that copied it. I believe Headhunter on the Dreamcast is a good example of this. But the whole being able to, you know, determine exactly when you're going to get hit and get out of the damn way is actually a really unique idea and it doesn't just make it so that if you're out of, if you've got like one foot out of cover, you'll get shot in that foot like two or three times and get told to get back in cover to get your health back because there's no regenerating health in Siphon Filter. It's all down to you keeping your ass in check. Not to mention all the unique things like the, the fun story and the... Fancy way of like doing things like commando rolling. There is, I will always approve games that have commando rolls on command, which is a funny way of saying it, but there you go. And there's a lot of extra little features in those games as well, like the great amount of weapons, the neat little two player mode, which would be great for the PlayStation Classic because you'd be able to play two players. But then again, considering you've only got 20 games on this thing, I'd feel bad about only including the first one because. There are three games in this series, the second has the best story, the third has the most content, and the first is... Well, it's the first. You can't really blame it for not being the best or the most content filled, but still, it's the first. And if they were to include that, I think that the there'd be a little bit of a... Um, I think it'd be a, dis a disservice to the series, we'll put it that way. But then again, 20 games, and who knows, hopefully they might be able to... Get some extra storage going on in here and here, but by they, I mean the hackers. Although I kind of wonder how the hackers are actually going to do it. Mainly because it looks like the charge port on the Classic is going to be a bloody USB-C port. At least judging by the bloody power cable, it looks like a USB-C port. It might be micro USB, but oh well. There has to be a way in inside this thing so that people can get like repairs and stuff. And I'm sure the hackers will find it and find a way to get more games on there very soon and when they do I'll probably end up buying the thing I don't actually plan on buying it outright but we'll wait and see apparently um I've been looking at the EB Games website which is actually the games website for um Australia EB Games is basically GameSpot if you I'm um, not, not GameSpot GameStop if you have an idea and they said, like, in the email that they sent out right after the thing got announced, they said that we will sell out. And apparently it is a USB micro B port, not a USB-C port. So whatever. But still, the the fact that the um, they, they sent out a thing that said, uh, we will sell out, we will sell out, we will sell out. It, I think it literally flashed at you, which was kind of funny. But if it didn't, it looked like it should. And they said it was going to sell out, but it's been what? Like... A couple of weeks now since they announced the original, uh, since they announced the PlayStation Classic, and it hasn't sold out yet. They haven't blanked out the button or anything. Now, the NES Classic and the, and the SNES Classic, those sold out immediately, like a snap of the fingers. So, the PlayStation Classic not selling out is interesting. Maybe they're making more, uh, more hardware for the PlayStation Classic. Maybe there's not many, as many pre orders, at least in Australia, anyway. I'm not going to claim to know what's going on at um, GameStop. Uh, or like any other European retailer, but yeah, that's the Australian situation right now. So let's get on to some of the more obscure games. Now, again, there are reasons one way or another. I don't expect some of these to be included, and we'll get on to why those are as we get to them, but at the same time, just, yeah, be, be aware there's a few games in here that might make it on by the skin of its teeth or via one 
piece of functionality in the game that might make it a really good addition to the PlayStation Classic, but this is more or less a, se a section where I get to talk about PlayStation games that I love that wouldn't show up on the PlayStation Classic and will probably give me a reason to mod the thing, so there you go. We'll start with Bushido Blade. Most people know this one, but in case you don't, it's basically... It's a high-intensity fighter from Square Enix. And by high-intensity, I mean that it's the sort of game where one or two shots can and will kill you. So you need to be on your toes the whole time. You have a selection of different characters and different weapons. Some of the characters are good with some weapons, but there's nothing stopping you mixing and matching if you prefer doing it a certain way. And knowing your opponent and knowing the weapons that they can use is very important in getting a good score on this game because if it's things like its stance system and the fact that yes one good hit to the chest will take you out so you need to be very careful about how you play Bushido Blade and considering that it is one of the most unique fighters more or less ever there have been similar uh, games that have a similar concept to it like Dive Kick I know I say Dive Kick I say it kind of ironically but at the same time that game is very high intensity in the fact that it'll only take one hit to take you out so you might want to be a bit careful in this sort of game, but at the same time, it would be a fantastic addition. Not to mention that it has all sorts of unique little gameplay things, like how the story mode makes it so that you have to follow a specific set of rules to get to the end, and I never beat the guy with the gun. And there's also, of course, two-player mode. So you do kind of want to have as many two-player games on this thing as possible. There is... A bit of a weird situation with the next set of games I want to talk about. They are licensed to the Looney Tunes because it's Bugs Bunny Lost in Time and its sequel, Bugs and Taz Time Busters. These are... Now, I'm going to admit that these are nothing special in the grand scheme of things. They're pretty bog-standard 3D platformers, especially Lost in Time. But they are very respectful to their source material, especially Lost in Time, where you run into a bunch of the big Looney Tunes characters from uh, different, in, in different time periods. So you've got Elmer Fudd as like the caveman hunter and you've got Yosemite Sam as the pirate. And they are really neat little things and just fights they got going on with them. And of course they are 3D platformers so they do the whole exploratory thing, give yourself a few extra abilities to get more stuff. Bugs, Bu Bugs and Taz Time Busters is actually a fair bit different because you control two characters simultaneously. And the two characters are required to actually do things like certain puzzles in certain areas of the game. And you collect more things. And of course, there are abilities that use both of them individually and both of them simultaneously. And you can actually play the game with two players. Bugs, Bugs and Taz Time Busters is a two-player cooperative 3D platformer. It's a little finicky because the camera stays locked on one player. But it is actually a really neat experience. And there are a bunch of different worlds and things to explore. It's got a fair amount of variety. The first game has a ton of variety. And they'll probably never show up on the PlayStation Classic due to the whole licensing thing, but they were really neat platformers back in the day. I would have loved to see them. And speaking of unique, let's talk about Bishy Bashy Special for a bit. Bishy Bashy Special is awesome. It's basically... WarioWare with the Japanese turned up to 100. You have a ton of weird stuff going on and a bunch of little mini games that you play using multiple different layouts of buttons on the controller. And you get scores and you got to tr and if you're playing single player, you have to basically get through while getting certain goals. And if you get all the way through, yeah, you win, but if you don't, well, you lose and you have to continue. In the case of the two player mode though, you can play against another player and see who runs out of lives first. It's really, it's really, really intense and it's actually a lot of fun trying to beat, beat someone in this game. It was originally ported from an arcade game which I actually had the opportunity to play a while back, although it was, it was called Gacha Gachamp in that case, but it was basically exactly the same game just with a different control scheme. The two games, uh, the two games they included, the Super Bishy Bashy and Hyper Bishy Bashy, and that was my phone going off. But yeah, that was Super Bishy Bashy and Hyper Bishy Bashy are two different separate things with different sets of mini games. So there's like 60 or 70 mini games in there in total. And it is a lot of fun to go through and play all of them, especially if you've got someone around to enjoy the madness with. Now, I bring up a game called Future Cop LAPD for more reasons than one. This game is basically two different sets of games. The first game is a mech shooter, although it's more arcadey than just simulation-y mech style, but Future Cop LAPD, basically you are a police robot 
and you are going you go through different kinds of levels with three different sets of weapons and you basically just blast the shit out of everything it's very cathartic everything explodes really well and it is a ton of fun and the first, the single player campaign will last you a few hours and it's got some repetitive um not some some repetitiveness but it is replayable to a point and it's actually pretty enjoyable the main reason I want to include this one on the PlayStation Classic though is because of its secondary mode. Now, there are games that did do this concept before the um, Future Cop LAPD came along, mainly Herzog Swy, but at the time, Herzog Swy had come out before I was born, so I kind of, um, I kind of never got to play a game like this before Future Cop LAPD, and to be fair, there are still very few games like this one, so it is actually kind of neat. So, it's kind of like a one-player MOBA. Now, I say that in a sense that there are probably better ways to describe it, but basically, you command the same robot, and you go and you take over facilities using little drones and helicopters that come out of your thing. You get resources and you spend them in order to actually increase your trooper force. So you can do things like uh, buy up a ton of individual troops and just march them along and protect them. Or you can buy a bunch of helicopters to try and hold back the advance while you go and you take over a bunch of the enemy's bases because this is a two-player competitive game. You do get a AI player, for example. The AI player is actually a fairly competent one, but still, excuse me, it doesn't actually beat playing against another human player. And it is actually a really cool time to go and just fight the other player head to head. If you both try and take over the same base at the same time, you'll both run into each other with a bunch of helicopters and turrets and just, it, it, it can turn into absolute madness. And it's a hell of a lot of fun just get going in and embracing the chaos. Admittedly, I spend more time on that mode than I spent on any other uh, than on the actual single player campaign. So it's a shame they never actually improved on it, but there you go. G Police. I am a big fan of G Police. I'm not usually into like the sort of first person view spaceship flying games, but I can appreciate a really good one, and G Police is a really good one. It takes place in a massive city with a bunch of different domes with lots of buildings in them. There's a ton of different missions, each with their own separate objectives, and it is really hard. Like, you need to put in a lot of effort to keep up with G Police. So you do want to, uh, you do want to play this game on a DualShock, admittedly, because it does have some extra controls that help with that, but you can play it on a uh, regular old PlayStation pad. That works, it's just a little bit iffy on the control side of things, but at the same time, it's still really enjoyable. It can be really hard, I will admit, but the different sets of objectives, the overall combat capability of it, and just the the general, like, technical impressiveness at the time of it, because the draw distance isn't great, but the, the places are huge, and there's tons of things to see in the city, which is surprising for a game of this kind. And doing so, you can fight enemies in the air, or you even end up having to drop to ground level at one point, and you're literally just flying along in these tunnels, shooting like little human dudes that are around the side trying to take out a target that you're trying to protect. And it is, it is a ton of fun going around and blowing the absolute crap out of everything. It's highly recommended if you're a fan of those sorts of games. Then we get on to a couple of racing games. I'm not going to bring up like Wipeout 3 or Motor Tune Grand Prix or anything like that because those games are pretty likely to turn up on the PlayStation Classic in some form. But I got to admit that there are some games that I would like to see on here that probably aren't going to show up and I'm going to talk about two of them. One of them is Scars. Nobody remembers this game as far as I can tell. Scars is a... It's kind of like a kart racer. But it's got this whole realistic, um, I'm just typing in the name of the game here just to make sure that I, yeah, that's, that, this is definitely the game I remember. I'm doing this mostly off the cuff, but yeah, it's basically a, it's, it's, it's kind of like a kart racing game, but it's all got, it's got this realistic sort of feel to it. Unfortunately, it looks like that Scars was the game that killed them. They developed a Game Boy Advance game like four years after Scars, but then they just closed, which was unfortunate. But the the game is, yeah, it's, it's a realistic kart racer, but it's got all these vehicles that look like animals. So you've got sharks and lions and all sorts of other neat little things like that. 
and you've got really good looking tracks that have tons of like depth and variety to them and you have a really long campaign to go through with a bunch of stuff to unlock it is a ton of fun to play the physics are also great each car is very different in the handling and they are just they they are a ton of fun to drive and the weapons are a good lot of fun as well you've got all the pretty basic ones admittedly like you've got one that goes ahead and um puts obstacles down for you to avoid you've got your missiles you've got your bomb that you have to pass on to other players but still, the game is a ton of fun, and it's got two-player split screen, so it would be a great little inclusion for this one. And hopefully I remember to actually do video footage of all of these. I'm probably going to be able to do that, but I'll just be ripping footage from all sorts of places. The other racing game I wanted to talk about is Roll Cage. Now, Roll Cage has actually gotten a bit of a resurgence recently. There is a game that's coming out on PlayStation, Xbox, and it's been in early access on PC for years at this point called Grip, which is basically the same concept. It's more or less like your cars are flat with wheels on either side that, uh, that extend to the entire height of the body, and you can flip upside down. And you can, like, drive on ceilings, and you can run right through buildings, and use all sorts of different weaponry to knock people off course. And the entire gimmick of being able to just flip upside down and keep going is really interesting, and the physics engines and track designs in these games have always been able to help it pull off that sort of concept, and it does a really good job for a game that was made back in the PlayStation 1 days, where people were still adapting to the whole 3D aspect, of, you know, just basically just making games in 3D in general. The fact that this game handles as well as it does even today is a hell of a, a hell of an achievement for something that was made all the way back in the... I can't remember exactly when this game came out. I think it was um, early 2000, 2000... I'm gonna look it up again. Bloody hell. I, uh, I'm, I'm mainly thinking about Roll Cage Stage 2. I never played the original game. Yeah, it came out in 2000. So the, the amount of effort that must have went into making this game feel so good is actually really impressive. I would fully recommend it for a console like this, and it does also have split-screen multiplayer, which would be a fantastic addition, because admittedly, uh, I'd like to see almost every game included in the PlayStation Classic have split-screen multiplayer, because I'd love to go and show my father these games. I think he'd appreciate some of them for their simplicity. Nevertheless, We'll move on to a game that I played an absolute ton of, but probably won't show up on the PlayStation Classic just because, you know, of its general, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just general game style, and that's Intelligent Cube, although I know it more by its European name, which is Kurushi! Kurushi is a puzzle game where blocks roll towards you, and you need to wipe them out using a little selector that you place on the ground. But if you do something like Get Crushed, the blocks will fall away. It's uh, The length of the stage is determined by basically um, how many blocks you let fall off. So if you get crushed, the blocks will all run away and you'll probably die. It is a very complicated game because you need to do everything in a very specific order and you need to do it very quickly. It feels more like an action puzzle game than just your traditional puzzle game. It is really, really, uh, really, really intense. And it actually gets really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you really want to just go through and try and beat the game. And the blocks and stages can get absolutely huge, and there's a couple of different special kinds as well to help you out. It's a really unique idea, but I don't think they'd be putting a space on the PlayStation Classic for it unless they had like a hundred games or something like that, which is a shame. And I feel exactly the same way about the next game, next game I'm going to talk about, which is Devil Dice. Who's played Devil Dice? Devil Dice is actually really cool. The the block the play fields are all dice. The dice is, the dice rise from the ground, and you walk on them and you roll them using your feet. And you have to try and organize them in different sorts of ways. And there are a ton of different game modes as well. There's individual puzzle modes. There's an arcade mode. There's a mode where you literally fight other characters and try to remove all their health or crush them underneath your dice. It's actually got a lot of variety for a game like this. And of course, it's got four-player multiplayer. Of course, that isn't going to matter for the PlayStation Classic, but even being able to play it in two-player would be nice. And it's got... It's just, it's just really charming. And it's a shame that it won't be included because, well... They said they're only going to have 20 games on this thing and just doesn't seem like they're going to have room for Devil Dice, which is really unfortunate because it... It would be a lot of fun to have Devil Dice on this thing, but I suppose not. 
My dog wants me, so I will return to this recording shortly. Alright, I'm back. So, we got a couple of other things to talk about. Uh, we're about halfway through my games list, by the way. So, there is one game that... We know it's going to be included, or at the very least, it would be amazing if it wasn't, and that's Metal Gear Solid. Now, I'm not gonna- I'm not talking about Metal Gear Solid here, but I just want to bring up that, again, the whole thing about not being able to include an entire franchise, or at least have, like, hidden unlockable games, kind of works against the idea of the PlayStation Classic, because being able to play through an entire franchise would be great, but I guess that's not going to be a thing. The thing about uh, the- why I'm bringing up Metal Gear Solid, though, is because the game I want to talk about in this particular sense is Metal Gear Solid VR Missions. Now, Metal Gear Solid VR Missions was a separate disc in North America and Europe, but it was released with the uh, special release of Metal Gear Solid in Japan called Integral. And basically, it's 300 missions that extend the gameplay of Metal Gear Solid by a few extra hours in a lot of really interesting ways. So, one of my... Uh, Alright, I'll go over what the different missions are. So basically, there's a mode where you have to sneak through every stage. Then there's a mode where you have to do it as fast as humanly possible with higher difficulty. Then you've got modes where you have to take the specific weapons and use them to kill, like, targets or just, um, general human enemies in the same way as you would in Metal Gear Solid. And then you have to do it again, but faster with a higher difficulty. That's the majority of the missions. And then, when you start getting above a certain percentage level, because the higher of a percentage completion rate you get on the missions, you unlock more missions. You start unlocking the special missions. Now, this, uh, they're probably called, like, um, Advanced or something. I haven't played Metal Gear Solid VR missions in a couple of years, which means it's probably time for me to start replaying it again. But, they give you a bunch of really special missions. Now... The special missions are really cool. There's a bunch of ones which literally have you being a bloody detective, trying to figure out who killed someone by relying on specific clues in the environment. Some of them are stupidly easy, but there's a couple that really take advantage of some of Metal Gear Solid's mechanics. Like, you have four different guards wandering around a snow-covered field, and you have to track the footprints of the one who actually did the murder. And there's a couple of other weird little things like that too. There's one where you have to fight off a gigantic UFO. There's one where you have to fight off a giant uh, genome soldier. There's what's what they call the VR mission. Now, it's a bit weird that they call it the VR mission, but it's basically just a straight shot of several different things where you have to go and scavenge supplies in order to make it to the end without losing all your health. And it is a really clever little idea, and it has a lot of fun and just like the regular target shooting or human shooting as well. Like there's a fantastic little trailer they played for the VR missions disc that I will probably play in the background of this video just so that I um just so I know what I'm talking about but still it's it's this fantastic little trailer that has a bunch of the different variety being shown off and it's a shame that they won't be able to include it, or at least they might not include it. I can't imagine that they'd include it as a secondary game when they've only got 20 games on there. But, you know, there you go. If you haven't played Metal Gear Solid VR missions, I'd recommend you go do it if you're a fan of the series. Because it is a lot of fun just playing around with the mechanics of the original Metal Gear Solid in that way. So, International Track and Field is my next one. I picked this one specifically because it doesn't have the Olympic license. And... Basically, you could do with a button mashing game like this one, especially since it's a two-player game and it's also got like up to four players. But at the same time, I can see why they wouldn't include four players because there's no like four player, there's no like four slots. It's a shame they didn't include like four slots, but then have like, you know, uh, have two controllers in the box and then just sell another two. But there you go. And basically, it's a button mashing Olympics game. You know the type where if you're sprinting, you gotta hit the circle and square buttons as fast as possible. If you're doing the hurdles, you have to hit the circle and square buttons as fast as possible and then press the X button. If you're doing something like kayaking, you have to time the button presses precisely. You get the general idea. It's one of those sorts of games. But it is one of the best games of those kind that I've played because it's very well polished and it has a fair few events. It doesn't have many, but the ones that it does have are like specifically the big ones and they are still really enjoyable and it's fun to play against a mate trying to hammer the buns faster than he can and you know get better times or worse times or whatever it would be a good addition just for you know a, a fun little bit of multiplayer competition but again i don't think they're going to include that one we're going to talk about apocalypse next for those of you who have never heard of apocalypse i do not blame you apocalypse is a very 
obscure title in that it is a bit, uh, it, it kind of just released and then just completely disappeared, which is weird because it has Bruce Willis in it. It's basically a Sweeto twin stick shooter in the sense that you move with the D-pad and you shoot with the face buttons and the face buttons will shoot in any particular direction. If you're holding two, you'll shoot in the diagonal. And that's basically the entire game. You've got like eight or nine different weapons that you can unlock throughout the game. And there are an absolute ton of stages, some of which have platforming, some of which are just full on bosses. And there's just a lot of fun stuff like that. And it, it's it's funny listening Bruce Willis, not, listening to Bruce Willis not give a shit. He absolutely does not care that he's in this game, but still, it's fun to play as basically Bruce Willis in a Bruce Willis movie, at least in these days, where he's basically completely invincible. And the ending of the game where you end up in the bloody White House killing the president who's been um, possessed by a demon is fantastic in how cheesy it is for a game ending like this one, but, well, there you go. So... Pro Pinball Big Race USA is... Uh, I know it sounds a bit weird that I'm not recommending a, a game like Time Shock, but I always preferred Big Race USA for some reason. Pro Pinball would actually be a nice thing to add to this entire uh, little project here, but at the same time it has come out on PC before, and I do believe the rights would be well expired at this point. But the general thing about Pro Pinball is that they are really accurate simulations of tables that don't exist. It feels like playing a real pinball table. You can change some of the difficulty to give you a bit of a leg up, like you can give yourself infinite balls and just play through the entire game in one shot, but that's no fun. The challenge isn't there if you do that, so I try and get through as far as I can. I've actually made it to the big race before, but well, you wouldn't know what that is. So basically, the general idea is you've got a bunch of different events and stuff you can do. And the idea is that you've got to get across the country to the big race. And then you have to do the big race all the way back to the other end. You've got all sorts of things you can get. Like you can upgrade your car. You can get nitro boosters. They'll automatically succeed a goal for you. And you can, of course, earn money by doing things like cab fares and other little events like that. It's a really well fleshed out and polished pinball game and I still go back to it from time to time. It's probably my favorite virtual pinball table and it's a shame that they can't get the license for something like Zen Pinball because that would be amazing. How many games have I talked about at this point? That's probably um like 13. Hang on, I'll count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Right, so if I wanted to pick one more game what would i pick to go into the final slot obviously this isn't going to be even remotely close to what's going to turn up on there but hmm what, what would i pick as my last game probably wild nine has anyone ever heard of wild nine this game basically just completely disappeared after it first came out too like for um apocalypse so wild nine is a game where you have this weird little electronic grappling hook it's a two-dimensional two platformer and you can pick up enemies using the whip and you can slam them into the ceiling or floor and then you can slam them into like, for example, a pile of spikes which you can then use to jump onto to get over those bloody spike pits. It's actually kind of amazing. The whip is really satisfying to swing around, especially if you pick up a dude and just slam it and in, slam them into the ground. It is really nice. And I do actually appreciate that weird little thing. And apparently it's um, somewhat related to Earthworm Jim, which I'm kind of surprised by. I am completely unfamiliar with, um, oh, he programmed Earthworm Jim. The guy who made Wild Nine programmed Earthworm Jim. That's fair enough. But yeah, Wild Nine is a fun time for its unique mechanic and I would really appreciate it going on. And that's 15, so I think I can stop talking about games there, but there are so many good games on the PlayStation. Like, there are a ton of RPGs that I have never played. I've never played the Final Fantasy games. I've never played the PlayStation 1 Dragon Quest game. I've never played Legend of Dragoon. I've never played um, Jade Cocoon. I've never played... Oh, God, there are so many RPGs. Like, um, Alundra. Uh, you name an RPG on the PlayStation and I've never played it. There's a ton of um, extra racing games I haven't gone into, like uh, C8 Racing, for example, also known as Max Power Racing. That game was amazing. Uh, there are some European exclusive games that would be great to play as well, but yeah, you get the general idea. The amount of games that they could potentially put on a PlayStation Classic makes it really disappointing that they're not actually going to include the ability to extend the storage, but 
Oh well, that's pretty much all we can really say about that, isn't it? So, I do apologize for the random, like, 40 minute rant at this point, but I honestly had no other content to put up, so, well, there you go. I am probably going to just put this up with just some cheap, like, trailer cuts and that's basically about it, but, oh well. It's a video and hopefully you enjoyed listening to me going on about some random PlayStation games that I absolutely love for 40 minutes, so, there you go. This has been Blue Maxima and... I might pick up the PlayStation Classic when it comes out. It depends on how much money I have. You see, I'm saving up for a new computer, and I think I'm almost there, but it might take me a little bit more extra effort in order to actually, like, get over the hump to get to it. Like, my old computer is kind of going down the drain as it is right now. I mean, it tends to blue screen at random for no particular reason, and I, I kind of need one that actually works, you know, for stuff like recording videos and stuff like that. But I'm also a PC gamer at heart, which means I kind of want to get something like a 1080 Ti. But, you know, that, that crap can get expensive. And of course, they released cards that are so far above and beyond the bloody cost of the uh, 1080 Ti that I feel like only getting the 1080 Ti is going to be my best option at this point. So, yeah, you know the drill. So I will leave you with that. I, um, again, I might pick up the PlayStation Classic. It depends. If it, if I'm like down, like, hang on, what day is December 3rd? In Australia, December, th well, I was about to say, it doesn't really matter. December 3rd is a Monday. Okay. So if I end up being able to get down there, um, down to an EB Games on a Monday, maybe I'll pick one up just like uh, on the face of it, but who knows? So yeah. Uh, hopefully I'll have videos for Pano Box and Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise for you. I do have Fist of the North Star loaded on my PS4 at the moment, but again, I'm waiting for the countdown to... As of this recording, I'm waiting for the countdown to finish, so there you go. Uh, yeah, I'll see you all next time.